Hello and welcome to this edition of the Palmetto Guardian. I'm Staff Sergeant Brad Mincy with the South Carolina National Guard. And uh, today we are talking with uh, Specialist David Erskine. Uh, he's on the other side of the desk today. Uh, he normally is our interviewer and he's going to be the interviewee today. How you doing? Welcome. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm actually a little nervous on this side of the mic. I'm not used to this. This is a uh... Uh, actually, I already messed up one take right before this because I'm not used to being on this side of the mic. <laughs> but uh, I am glad to be here and, and, and glad that I have the opportunity to, to share my, my story, I guess. Well, good. We're glad to have you. So uh, today, this is the uh, third segment on remembering 9-11. So uh, you were telling me earlier a little bit uh, about kind of your situation and what happened with you. Uh, I, I know with me, I had just gotten out when 9-11 uh, when happened, literally just a few weeks before, and was ready to be called up at any moment, uh, although that never happened. Uh, so tell us how your situation is a little bit differently. What, uh, what happened to you? Well, actually, um, I guess mine initially started with the fact that I lost my job uh, at the factory I was working at. And I, I, really, I, I was looking for employment. And, and I've, I've told this story on, on the podcast before, but I, I was looking for employment and the air guard was hiring. And I came in and I actually wanted to be a cook, was what I originally came in for. And uh, went through the whole process was ready to go and, and was coming in to sign my paperwork. So was being a cook something you had had uh, some prior experience with? Yeah, um, I'd, uh, I'd cooked in some of the local restaurants here in Columbia. Um, I'd, I'd actually got accepted to culinary school at the time, uh, Johnson & Wells when it was still down in Charleston. And so I was, I was super excited to kind of maybe tie my whole life together at that point in time um, uh, to go back to cooking and, and get the education and then be able to do it in the military and everything kind of one one shot one kill and it, it, um, I don't I say unfortunately but nothing not, good things have come from the situation of how things worked out for me around 9-11 and, and me signing up to come into the military. So what was your initial draw? Uh, was it 9-11 that that brought you into wanting to join the military? No um, I, I, I was actually I was scheduled to come sign my paperwork on 9 I was to sign my final contract and everything on 9-11. Um, I already went through all my physicals. I had picked my job. Uh, bonuses had been approved, kind of the whole nine yards. Literally, 9-11, I was just coming in to put my name on the dotted line and, and swear in and make it official. And uh, it didn't play out that way at, at all. So what, what happened that morning? Well, I... Um, I was actually getting ready to come in. I, I, I was actually going by. My dad worked at SLED, and I was I was off because I had no job at that point in time. Uh, I was going by to go see him, and me and my cousin were going to go see him. And I was I had my appointment, I think, a little bit later towards noon or lunchtime or somewhere around in there. And uh, I remember I don't I didn't have a cell phone at the time, but I think my pager, I had a pager. I had a pager. Oh, um, you're one of those guys. I had a pager. Uh, pager went off, and I saw his dad's work number, so we swung by and, and called him real quick, and he's like, where are you at? And I said, we're riding around. I said, we headed over, you know, where you are. And he says, you listening to the radio or anything? And I was like, we might have been, but it was probably like a, it's maybe been a CD. It wasn't, wasn't regular radio. It wasn't FM radio at the time. And uh, he goes, he goes, you're not out to base yet or not? And I said, no. He started telling me what was going on up in New York, and so we we immediately rushed over and um, found somewhere we could get uh, a television, eyes on some type of television. I can't remember where we stopped. I can't remember if we went into like Kmart and went to their electronic section, but we were over in the Irmo area, of South Carolina. But we stopped in there, and uh, I remember watching it, you know, in, in that situation, and I was like, "There's no way this is actually happening," you know. I was like, "This has got to be." You know, and for a lot of people, and I, you know, talk to people and they've mentioned it, you know, they thought it was just like a Cessna or something that didn't get altitude or, you know, some hobbyist pilot got off course. And then my immediately thought went to, oh my God, I'm supposed to be out at the base today. And so I called and they were like, nope, don't come anywhere near here. They were like, you're not going to get on. There's no reason to try. We will get back in touch with you. They were basically, uh, oddly enough, the military basically told me, don't call us, we'll call you, uh, type situation. And so I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm, you know, I had no clue at this point in time what I was, 
it disheveled my life, you know, because I, I knew I was signing up on 9-11. I, I knew I had training dates and I knew, you know. So you had a plan already kind of set in place. Plan, yeah, you, know, you had, had your mind set yeah, where you knew where you were going to go. I kind of knew, you know, the time frame of when and how I was going to be gone and how many weeks, you know, and I'd already made plans with my family, um, um, girlfriend at the time and everything. And so I was like, well, what, what happens now? You know, like now I'm looking at not to have a selfish thought, but like this immediately not being able to go sign up and stuff. I was like, well, how is this? How do I put food on my plate for the next month or so? Like I said, I wasn't working at the time. Um, and I know that's kind of a selfish thought to have at that point in time, but it, it was an immediate concern um, about the situation. You know, that was just an immediate impact it had on my life. A very small impact compared to the rest of the world, but I mean, it was an impact. So, so how did this change and uh, how did you eventually get around to getting into the guard? So it might have been a couple weeks later or so after, you know, Obviously, we were still reeling, but you know the bases were working through their their uh, their different force protections. Of course, everybody had shot up to uh, Delta at that point in time, and uh, recruiter called me and said, "Hey, ready for you to come in? We'll get you signed up." All right, no problem. Uh, wind up going out on October seventeenth of that year. So, so a little over a month later. A little over a month later, finally finally made it out of the base, and of course I get there, and recruiter sets me down, and she goes. So I was looking back through your paperwork. She goes, I see we have you signed up to be a cook. So I said, that's what I want to do. And she was like, um, I looked at your ASVAB scores. And I was like, yeah. And she goes, are you sure you want to be a cook? And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure I want to be a cook. And she was like, nah, we really don't need cooks. <laughs> I was like, so are you telling me I can't be a cook? And she was like, I'm kind of telling you that. She was like, you can if you want to. She goes, but I can't say that they'll approve it. So they're saying, yep, trying to, try to get you into something else, try something new. Yeah, and so I said, well, I said, you know, I, I definitely want to come in. I've gone this far. I was like, show me what you got, you know. And so she took me down to communi communication, SAT, I think it was SATCOM, air guard folks, if I say that wrong. It's been a while since I remember getting taken down there. But she took me down to the SATCOM stuff, and, uh, and she was like, you know, you could do this. She goes, uh, I'm assuming they still call it EOD in the Air Force. She goes, but, you know, there's opens and, and that type of stuff, you know, ordinance type stuff. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And that was actually the second time I'd been asked to do that. And I was like, do I just have that look of somebody who needs to be handling explosives? And I was like, no. Um, and then she took me down to the medical group. And she was like, we have a new AFSC that's coming in. And I was like, okay. And she pulls out this massive book. I mean, it looked like the first eight volumes of the... Britannica encyclopedia is shoved into one book and she goes this is what you'd have to know to do the job and I was like all right challenge accepted what is it <laughs> and uh, it was cardiopulmonary technician she was like we have two for the state and she kind of gave me a rough overview because she was like honestly she goes we're not 100% sure what y'all are going to do so I think when all this started out you know Air Force Basic was something like six to eight weeks somewhere in that time frame and then to go be a uh, a cook wasn't maybe but another couple months you know worth of training and I said okay sure you know I'm, I'm down if this is kind of where y'all need me and it looks interesting I'd like to give it a shot so now had you had any prior experience no, at all no, with no, medical no, medical no, or medicine other than my mom chanting that she wants me to become a doctor absolutely none um, and so I was like I remember reading medical books when I was younger but that was about it so you had a little bit of interest in it yeah I mean when I was younger I did I uh, I remember reading, God, the doctors used to keep them in the, especially the old school docs, used to keep the big books of, uh, keep all the different disease processes and stuff, and you basically read through all the definitions, and, and I remember doing that, going to the doctor. So, outside of that, I'd never, I'd never wanted to, to do anything in the medical field. And I said, okay, let's, um, let's give this a shot and, and see how it goes. And I said, how long is tech school? And she was like, six months. I was like, Ooh, hey. How you doing? Um, and she goes, I said, okay. I said, well, that's not terrible. You know, I was like, eh. The first time I'd been away from my family other than going to college, which I went to school up at Clemson for about a year or so, which, I mean, I still wasn't but a couple hours away. So, you know, first first time going to be away from my, my family for any kind of long period of time. I was like, all right, you know, a couple months of basic, six months of, of uh, tech school for Air Force. Not bad. And they go, oh, yeah, by the way. 
you got a, about a year, year and a half worth of OJT you got to do on top of it to get all your certifications to come back and work at the guard units because we don't have the equipment for you to to do this in, in state. And I was like, oh, 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 oh now we're talking two so years. So now we're talking two years, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, kind of, you're feeding it to me a little bit at a time. But anyway, I wound up doing it and I loved it. I loved it. Um, it was it was awesome. It was something that I would have never picked had um, that situation not happened, had 9-11 not happened. Um, and I'm, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Obviously, 9-11 was, was tragic and it was horrible. Um, but as I've talked to people, and even on the podcast, being on the other side of the mic, it's interesting to find how these... Uh, for lack of a better term, silver linings have kind of popped up. Um, and one gentleman we talked to, he wound up gaining a passion for bagpipes. Um, the other young lady that we talked to earlier in the week, she was, you know, her family was military. <coughs> oh, <coughs> that's live action bug down throat right there for y'all. <coughs> it's a little unfortunately. <laughs> that was a little unfortunate. That was, um, yeah, but we'll work through it. Um, but, you know, it helped solidify her path to going to the military with her father being military and stuff like that. And for me, it really up and it was terrible that it happened. But because of the military and everything else, it opened up this whole new path in my life. Um, and and as, as dumb as it sounds, I would have never met my wife had this not happened because uh, we wound up meeting in the hospital. She was a nurse. And, and had I continued down my chosen path that I had chose for me, I'd have never met her. So it was kind of weird. Um, now, as far as the experience of getting the basic and everything, that was wild. Um, so is it kind of what you were expecting or is it completely out of, out of the norm for what you're used to? Well, yeah, because, you know, I've been part of like the student flight and stuff out at, out at McIntyre. And obviously before 9-11 and going out to the base and stuff, it was just, you know, come on, you had a little sticker on your window and you shut them dry, you know, come on in and whatever else. And, we got to basic, and and by the time I got basic in February. And where'd you go? Uh, Lackland Air Force. Okay. Base, home, home of everybody that's ever worn the blue uniform in the Air Force. We all go through there at some point in time. Um, but um, went down there, and like I said, it was February when I got there. So we weren't far removed at all. Uh, security and stuff was still obviously very tight. But the way the, the what do they call them? They don't really call them uh, drill drill sergeants, but um, the, I think they call them TIs, technical instructors on the air air side. If I'm incorrect on that, somebody can correct me. Um, but everything was security. Everything was security. I knew it was going to be hard from the physical nature and from you know mental nature of learning things. I knew that part of it was going to be taxing. But really, what just blew my mind was the amount of security that we were we were doing. Um, one of the one of my first memories of Air Force Base, it, we just got there. We were rainbow flight still. And our barracks had stairs. You know, you had your bay down at the bottom that one flight was in, and then you went upstairs and another flight was up above it or whatever. And one of the things they practiced was when the instructors, not to say they were bad guys, but the instructors weren't allowed in our bays per se. It was a security type thing. It was security training is what it was. And... When the instructor got in the stairwell, the airmen were supposed to holler, instructor in the stairwell, and it's supposed to carry out, and the guy was supposed to hit the door. And he wasn't supposed to let them in unless they gave proper identification and the whole nine yards. We didn't know. We did not know his flight, you know, as, as a rainbow flight. And our instructor came blowing by us in the stairwell. I was like, man, he's in a rush for something. And I heard him hit the door, and when he hit the door, the guy didn't make it to shut the door. And it was on. It was on. Like, I felt bad for the, for the poor boy that got, got lit up. Um, but that was how serious they were taking security at that time. Not to say that we – but there is a difference between peacetime security and, 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 and war. And you could tell that the instructors out at Lackland were very serious about our safety security as well as the security of the family members in the base. And um, there was always constantly base – cops patrolling through you know our areas and stuff like that so uh, stories I'd heard because my, my cousin actually went through Lackland Air Force Base a couple years before me and it was nothing like that yeah. when he went through so I knew there was a 
I knew enough to know that there was a change in how business was being done, and, and obviously it was related to 9-11. Back to something you were talking about earlier. So uh, you you said that you initially were going in as a cook and that you'd already had some experience with that. As someone who's known you for almost 10 years now, working together in the public affairs field, um, one of the things that I know about you is that uh, you are – you like to learn. Uh, you you very much go into uh, trying to find new things. Every time I talk to you, you're yeah. you're learning, telling me about something else that yeah. you're learning about. Uh, do you think were you already kind of like that, or uh, do you think this this getting into the Air Force and changing fields kind of helped maybe blossom that a little bit more? Um, I think maybe it kind of fed into it. Um, oddly enough, for most of my life, even from when I was maybe five, six years old, or I had always known what I wanted to do. Um, I, I fell in love with dinosaurs. I'm not saying that most young kids don't fall in love with dinosaurs, but I fell in love with dinosaurs where I already knew at five, six years old, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I knew I wanted to be in the science realm. In all honesty, that continued all the way up until I went to college. When I went to college, I went as, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the bug's coming back to haunt me. Um, I went in to, as a uh, declared major as, as biochemistry. Um, cooking was something I kind of found on the way. So that was kind of really one of the first things I had learned outside of my plan, I guess. And then here was something where, once again, I had a plan. People who know me now would not believe that I was very much a strict planner of, I was gonna do this, this, and this, and everything had steps involved in it, and I knew exactly where the steps were. Um, so yeah, it kind of turned me on my head a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I was 100% going to be a cook, I'd already decided. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 not really. I mean, you can, but we can't guarantee it type thing. And so I was like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll try something new and different. And I honestly, that's one thing that I actually love about the military is the opportunity to learn whatever. Obviously, I've gone from being medical to public affairs. Uh, <coughs> Boy, that, that bug's holding on something fierce. Um, to uh, dangling by the uvula, he is man. He's in there. He's got something going on. But uh, and and did airport services and cargo and loaded planes. And, and that's what I've always one of the things I've always thought was extremely cool about the military is the opportunity to just learn. And really, I guess maybe that the military was my first introduction to that type of mentality. Um, because even when you do your job. I mean, even just being public affairs, we're public affairs, but we still learn how to be soldiers, which is a completely different job than public affairs. So it's just built in that you will be multifaceted when you're in the military. So being public affairs, you've had the opportunity to probably talk to a lot of people. You already mentioned some of the other people that you've discussed 9-11 uh, with. Uh, what's uh, one of the more uh, unique aspects, uh, one of the things that kind of really stands out uh, about 9-11, people that you've uh, come across, uh, or stories that you've heard? Um, well, I'll kind of go back to kind of the start of, of things was and these were the same people I went through school and stuff with. So I, obviously I went through school with a lot of medical people. And part of it was was our OJT and stuff before we kind of got permanent duty stations or went back to home station or whatever else. And so we kind of became a, a tight-knit group. And, um, and we kept in touch there for a while. A lot of us did for a good bit after, you know, we moved on to our different stations and stuff. But we, like I said, we spent a lot of time with each other. And I remember uh, one boy I was friends with, uh, he wound up getting his duty assignment, which was Germany. Uh, kind of right as everything was, you know, obviously been about a year or so into it by the time, two years or so into it. By the time we gotten out of school and gotten our duty stations or went back home. And I remember him calling me. He's, he's a young boy, super nice guy. He's just one of those he was legitimately giving his shirt off his back kind of guy. He was young. He was from uh, Minnesota, actually. And I remember him getting to Germany. He called me, uh, and he was in a panic because uh, he was getting his first set of casualties. So we did critical care transports and stuff like that. And I hadn't, I hadn't dealt with a whole lot of stuff like that at that point in time. I would soon deal with some stuff like that. But I just remember thinking how you know how why you know you, you're grasping at straws and answers 
and, and here's one of your buddies, you know, he's not directly hurt, but you can tell he's d disturbed about it. And, you know, we went from where we saw each other every day, you know, leading in this, and we were all relatively young. Matter of fact, I was probably the oldest person out of the group at 23, 24. I think there was maybe one other person older than me. Um, <clears throat> but you, you want to be able to reach out and do something for him, but it's his time to step up into that situation. And, uh, and so, you know, obviously we kept in touch and you started to see in us change, I guess, uh, from it. And, and we got, we got stronger as it went on. And really that's what it was. It was a certain level of strength. And <clears throat> I talked earlier, on uh, one of the other episodes, uh, with a gentleman that was EMT or, or did medical stuff. And I talked about, you know, medics being able to kind of kick that switch on and, and how, you know, when, when you falter, you know, you run the risk of somebody losing their life in that, in that situation. And you, you just don't, you just don't. So it, it was interesting to s actually see our conversations grow. You know, the, the conversations became more mature and we became stronger in our conversations. We became stronger in our convictions. Uh, we became more sure of what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> it, I mean, it, it was not great to have to grow in that situation, but at the same time, I think it made us better and it even made us more close-knit at that time, which we needed. I mean, we were half the world away, but we, you know, we knew type thing. Um, so that, I think that was an interesting <clears throat> aspect because, you know, like I said, I signed up going into a situation where the military was at a peacetime. I mean, obviously I signed up, I know there's a chance of some type of conflict, but you don't think the day you go to actually join the military, that's when the conflict's going to start, you know. <clears throat> and you got to do a little self-check. I mean, I hadn't signed on the dotted line at that point in time. I could have been like, mm, this is not what I wanted to sign up for. I'm out. You know, um, so what made you go ahead and go through with it? Uh, you know, I think it was a little bit of pride. You know, it was a little bit of pride, and I think that it was a little bit of honor. You know, I'd already talked to these people. I'd went this far with this situation with with signing up. Um, <clears throat> you know, how does that reflect on me as a person? How does it reflect on my family as somebody who raised this person that, you know, yeah, I'm going to be part of the military and I want the bonuses and the money and all this. And then at the first sign of trouble, I go, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, I was just kidding. I was just here for the money and the bonuses. Um, so you just wanted the college. You just wanted, yeah, I just wanted the college. Yeah. I just wanted the money. Um, and, and, you know, part of it. And like I said, I came from a military family. My cousin had been in, my dad, my grandfather, and whatever else. So I had a little bit of heritage, I guess, there. Um, and you know, oddly enough, I don't think anybody in my family would have looked down on me had I been like, no, I'm not going in. Um, dad might have looked at me and been like, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you agreed, go, uh, type thing. Which, I mean, that would have been expected. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, it's... Uh, you know, I don't even know if I had a thought process. I just, I think it just was bottom line. I knew I had to, you know, I knew going in, signing up that there was a chance of conflict one day. Like I said, I just didn't expect it to be that day. Um, and, uh, yeah, if I, if I wasn't, it would have been dangerous for me to come in half hearted. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I absolutely. Think, I think that makes sense. It would have been dangerous. Just like when you play a sport, you, you go into something half hearted. That's when you get hurt. Or that's when you get other people hurt. Um, and I was already kind of full hearted into it. You know, I was, I mean, for me, I was, I had already changed my AFSC. You know, I, I knew at that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind, I was signing up to go into a conflict of some nature. I knew I was going to have to deal with it at some level, you know. You're going to front end, back end or something. Something. I was, I was going to be involved in it. And, um, and so I did. And, I pressed it and I don't, I don't regret it. I mean, sure. Every career and anywhere has bumps, bruises and ups and downs. That's just part of life, you know? And so I've had, oddly enough, you know, you, you join during a conflict situation uh, and I've had so much good come out of such a bad thing. And I really think that's uh, I mean, loss in those situations is always terrible. 
it's always terrible to lose. And any, any loss of life is terrible, no matter who, what it is type situation. Um, but it's just, I think the part that keeps amazing me about the situation, <clears throat> even this far along in my career, is how much, it just shows how resilient we are as a people of how much good has come out of that situation. It was an opportunity for a lot of people to roll over and give up across the board, military, family members of the situations, first responders, all of them could have just rolled over and gave up and been like, this is too much for us to handle. And I just, I see every story is, <clears throat> is sad and it's terrible to think out, but there always seems to be some type of positive that these people, they, they, they pick themselves back up and, or, or, and just, they, they made something good come of it. And I think that's the coolest part of the stories. So it sounds like you've had a pretty good experience in the military. Uh, you've you've done quite a few things. You've been uh, both Army and Air Guards. So <laughs> and Air Reserve. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a pretty good uh, a pretty Air good Reserve. successful career here in the military. Yeah, I have. Um, I never came into the military hunting rank. Like I said, when I got switched over to the cardiopulmonary job, there was two of us, and there was an R and E five above me, and those were only going to be the ever the only two slots in the state. For, for that job. So even at that point in time, I was looking at maybe getting out of it as an E6, you know, if I did my whole career over there. Um, <clears throat> well, I tell you what, he's tough. He's tough. Somebody needs to give this bug an award or something. But, um, hey, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's been a good career. I, I've enjoyed it. I've got to do stuff that most people will never get to do. You know, I flew on the back of Chinooks, and I've been in Blackhawks, and I've been at Live Fires with Paladins, which is obviously been mostly public affairs, um, but I have saved lives and um, not just of soldiers and airmen, but of their families and their children. And um, you don't, uh, you, you don't know how stressful and rewarding those situations can be until you've, you've been in them. Um, you know, my wife's medical and obviously medical people have a different sense when it comes to stuff, but uh, even more so when you're military because a patient isn't just a patient when you're in the military. That's, uh, that's your brother, your sister in arms, that's their wife, their husband, their child. Um, and so a loss of life at that level is not only a loss of life in general, but it's a loss of life of your family. And uh, that was always tough. It was always tough to, to to have to lose anybody in uniform um, or any of their family members and stuff. Not to say that loss of life is ever easy, but it's just there's a little something extra that that to <clears throat> to totes with it when when you got those type of situations. On the other side of that, when you you know you, you try to push past those points and and keep going um, because when you you do reunite that family together or when you know, you, you know, you're part of the process that let this airman or soldier or Marine or uh, Navy person go home to their family. Yeah. You don't, there, there is no other high emotion award rank on the planet that comes close to it. There, there is not a four star general promotion that has the amount of energy and emotion that knowing that person gets to go home with their family because of something you did remotely comes close to. But it's just not, it's not, it's, it's not even possible. So, yeah, huge, huge impact on my life, especially my younger life. Well, anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, you know, the, the only other thing I, I'd like to say is, <clears throat> as we talk about 9-11 and my wife, my, my and I didn't meet until after, so she married into a military person uh, during this mass amount of op tempo stuff. And and we're at that point where there are a lot of wives like that, you know. A lot of people were married before 9-11, and it happened, and they just kind of... But, you know, you got to gotta sh shout out to those spouses out there that married into the military because they... They, for lack of better terms, they listed, enlisted into a conflict the same Knowingly as, came into it. Knowingly came into it. They knew. It's not like beforehand in peacetime when, when these spouses would get married and they'd say, oh, I might get deployed. I might have to go here. I, I'm going to be at training for a month here. You marry into this situation and you marry a military member, 
like clockwork, you can say that there's going to be some level of op tempo, whether it's stateside stuff that they're doing to backfill and help or train up, you know, units that are going, or it's the actual units they that are actually being deployed over. So, I mean, we have to take time, you know, to say thank you. And obviously I'm saying thank you to my wife. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they need the nod to just like, just like the military member does. Yeah. Many of our military guys, again, being public affairs, we run into people who've had not just one, but two, three, four deployments uh, sometimes as, as the guard, particularly South Carolina National Guard, as, as well as other guard units have picked up a lot of the pace, uh, pieces and paces that the, the regular army can't do. So yeah, having, having that connection, uh, having that outreach for family service member care, those types of things, making those units uh, connecting with the family, that, those are definitely important things to, to have and to, to keep, in our, keep in the back of our mind as we work through these. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, Special Zerskin, it was a pleasure having you, uh, getting to talk some stories with you. Yeah. Uh, again, I, you know, we, we've known each other for almost 10 years now, but, uh, you know, anytime you have the opportunity to sit down and talk with somebody, you always learn a little bit more about them, uh, find out more about their life experiences. Yeah, I was, I was, I'm glad y'all let me share my story, but I'm, I'm super ready to get on the other side of the mic because this is a little bit more intense on this side. <laughs> Thank well, we appreciate, appreciate you sitting down uh, with us today. And uh, thank you for joining us again on uh, the Palmetto Guardian. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, checking in with you next time.